Hi, it's Katrina. The Tunisian Atlantis. Atlantis was described by Plato as an island located just beyond the Pillars of Hercules, and it was destroyed by the wrath of the gods, never to be seen again. Most myths of Atlantis state that it plunged beneath the waves of the sea. However, there is another theory that says Atlantis was actually located in modern Tunisia, and that it didn't sink beneath the ocean, but beneath the sands of Africa. Believe it or not, this was a hot theory prior to the Second World War. Scholars were obsessed with the idea of a Tunisian Atlantis. We know that Tunisia was home to some of the greatest civilizations of the ancient world, occupied by the Egyptians and even the Carthaginians, who would wage war against Rome. We also know, based on archaeological excavations, that Tunisia was inhabited about 100,000 years ago by early humans. There is an interesting, little-known geological feature of the country. It's dotted with large salt lakes known as chots, which fill with water in cooler weather and then dry out during the summer months. One of these is called Chat el Jerid, and it's located right in the center of Tunisia, about 124 miles from the coast. Scientists agree that a large oasis once stood here, and they've even discovered the ruins of an ancient city nearby, as well as the remnants of an irrigation system. The fabled Pillars of Hercules may have been a reference to the Temple of Hercules, which can also be found nearby. Atlantis may very well have been an oasis society in the Tunisian desert. Far from the coast, a group of highly advanced people may have lived in a gigantic city of water and palm trees, but the oasis dried up, the society failed, and the ruins of Atlantis were buried by the sands of the desert. What do you think? Let me know in the comments below. The Nibiru Cataclysm The Nibiru Cataclysm is one of the wildest conspiracy theories out there. It's a crazy theory that claims any day now, Earth is going to collide with a massive planetary object called Nibiru, or Planet X. The idea came about in 1995 thanks to a woman named Nancy Leiter, who founded the website Zeta Talk. She claimed to have received a message from extraterrestrials dwelling in the Zeta Reticuli star system, and they wanted her to warn mankind of the impending doom. It was a wild fringe theory that blossomed in the 2000s, spread across the world, and is now well known by a lot of people. It's been debunked by every major scientist, seeing as a planet-sized object near Earth would have already destabilized the orbits of everything around us. Still, there are some who say Planet X is making its way toward us right now from the edge of the solar system, or that it's hiding behind the sun and so we can't see it. And soon, it will crash into us and all humanity will be lost. Stoned Apes Despite all we know, scientists still can't figure out how humans evolved from Homo erectus to Homo sapiens in the short span of 200,000 years. Homo erectus had an extraordinarily small brain. It was one of our earliest human ancestors, but it wasn't about to win any spelling bees. 200,000 years later, Homo sapiens had evolved to have the big brains that brought us to the moon and back. Scientists are baffled as to how this happened. One of the stranger theories was proposed by a mystic and psychonaut named Terence McKenna. He proposed that over 200,000 years ago, Homo erectus began to eat magic mushrooms, scientifically known as Psilocybe cubensis. Eating magic mushrooms doubled the size of the Homo erectus' brain by quite literally opening up its mind. The effects of the magic mushrooms would have increased the desire to procreate, heightened clarity and focus to make hunting easier, and also would have stimulated never-before-touched language portions of the brain, inducing religious experiences. Scientists believe magic mushrooms could have worked as an evolutionary catalyst in early hominins. It would have pushed the brain to its limits, forcing it to become more complex and to develop better, more sophisticated thinking processes. However, it's still just a theory and hasn't been proven as fact. Greeks in Peru In the 8th century BC, the Greek poet Hesiod described a place at the end of the world, a mysterious place where the horribly ugly Gorgons lived and where Atlas resided as a giant mountain. This mysterious place at the end of existence was bordered by a massive chasm filled with an impassable and treacherous sea. While this may just sound like a made-up story from almost 3,000 years ago, 
Some believe it's describing a real place on Earth. For example, Dr. Enrico Matievich from the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro claims Hesiod was talking about Peru, specifically the ruins of Chavín de Huantar in the Peruvian Andes. He even wrote a book about it called Journey to the Mythological Inferno back in 2011. He suggested that Homer's Odyssey was not supposed to take place in Greece, but was actually set in South America. While it may sound crazy, Matievich makes some pretty good points. For example, Hesiod's geographical description of the end of the world does fit nicely with the Peruvian Andes, and local legends going back thousands of years also match what the poet said. Hesiod wrote, The chasm is so great that once past the gates, one does not reach the bottom in a full year. This was almost certainly describing the gates of Pongo de Manseriche, a gorge at the beginning of the Marañón River. It very well could have taken the Greeks a year to navigate the length of the river, at which point they would have reached Peru. Then they came to a place called the House of Night, rumored to be the home of the Gorgons. This could have been Chavín de Huantar, a huge city resting in the Andes where strange-looking people resided that the Greeks had never seen before. What do you think? Did ancient Greeks make it to Peru and live to tell the tale? Let me know in the comments below. Giants in America There are multiple theories from around the world that suggest there was a race of giants living on our planet not too long ago. But we're going to focus on the theory of giants in America, something that, if proved correct, would change the way we see history. The main evidence for giants living in North America comes from the 19th century. This was a time of great expansion in the United States, when mines were being dug, gold was being pulled from the ground, and new New cities were being built everywhere. At the turn of the century, hundreds of reputable reports came in across the nation of giant skeletons being found. People were digging up ancient burial mounds across the country and finding the bones of humanoids upwards of seven feet tall. According to reports in local New England newspapers backed by the Scientific American magazine, skeletons were unearthed at both the Monks Mound and the Cahokia Mound, two of the largest ancient structures built by the indigenous people of North America. But that's not all. Giant skeletons were allegedly found in Martha's Vineyard, Deerfield Valley in Massachusetts, upstate New York, and in the Ohio River Valley. The Chickasaba Mound in Arkansas also revealed great big skeletons, some of which were 10 feet tall and had double rows of teeth like aliens. The craziest part is that by the time the 20th century rolled around, all these skeletons had vanished. All scientific publications began denying they had existed, and the whole thing became a conspiracy theory rather than real, tangible science. The Creation of the Moon Scientists say there is a chunk of moon rock hiding deep inside of the Earth. The theory has been around for a long time and has something to do with the protoplanet named Theia. Scientists think that during Earth's infancy, 4.5 billion years ago, Theia collided with the planet and smashed into pieces. This is kind of like the theory of Planet X, only it already happened a really long time ago. Scientists even believe Theia is buried inside of the Earth's mantle in two giant chunks, each one the size of a massive continent. These pieces likely sit beneath West Africa and the Pacific Ocean, kind of like a pair of headphones strapped to the planet. Each one is hundreds of miles tall and over 1,000 miles wide. PhD student Chiang Wan from Arizona State University says the chunks are the biggest things in the mantle. We know they are there because of scientific readings looking into the rock. We just don't know for sure if they came from an alien planet. However, seismic readings have shown something interesting. Seismic shock waves from earthquakes slow down abruptly when they pass through these particular chunks of rock. This suggests they have a chemical composition different to everything else in the mantle. They could be part of Theia, the hypothetical planet, which would also make Make them chunks of the moon itself. The theory also says that during the collision, a piece of Theia broke off and became our one and only moon. Noah's Skeleton Back in 2014, the Penn Museum in Philadelphia discovered the remains of a dead man in their storage room. This individual died 6,500 years ago and was excavated from southern Iraq in 1930. His skeleton was then stored at the museum and forgotten about until just recently. He was 50 years old when he died and stood at a modest 5 feet 9 inches tall. He also may have been Noah from the Bible. The man was buried in a nondescript coffin without anything that could identify him. In that way, there is no actual way of telling if he was Noah from the Bible. However, he was 
was buried in a deep groove cut into the silt, and the geology at his burial proves he was alive following an epic flood. He wasn't the only skeleton on Earth either. The team back in 1930 discovered at least 48 graves, but they only packed one up and shipped it away for study. These people appear to have been some early race of humans living in the cradle of civilization after a devastating flood. There are some who say these were the children of Noah, the first humans living in a society after the flood. Others, like the archaeologist who worked on the analysis, say it's all just a coincidence. The Legendary Hellhound of Suffolk Archaeologists in England discovered the skeleton of a gigantic dog in the ruins of Lyston Abbey. This canine stood seven feet tall on its hind legs, like a dire wolf straight out of a fantasy book. The remains were found in the same region where locals speak of a legendary hellhound called Black Shuck. The hound supposedly had red eyes like the flames of hell, a thick black coat, and it terrorized villagers back in the 16th century. According to the legend, the hellhound appeared on August 4, 1577. It came during a storm, when the thunder shook the sky and the doors of the Holy Trinity Church in Blithburg burst open and the snarling dog ran inside. It tore through the congregation, killed at least two people, and then fled as the steeple collapsed. This was widely recorded at the time by multiple sources. As crazy as it sounds, most legends are somewhat rooted in reality, and the bones of the gigantic dog do do seem to suggest that some kind of unusual beast lived near the abbey around 1577. Judging on the bones, the creature would have weighed about 200 pounds, which would have made it big enough to easily eat a man. The Orion Correlation Theory There are a lot of crazy theories surrounding the Egyptian pyramids, and one of them is that they were built in direct alignment with the stars. In fact, the theory is talked about so much that most people simply think it's true. But the actual truth is a little more complicated. Yes, the ancient Egyptians definitely tracked the night sky. They knew the constellations and used the stars to make important decisions about planting and harvesting. The pyramids of Giza were built around 2500 BC, meaning if they had been aligned with the stars, they would have been aligned with the stars 4500 years ago. The sky did not look the same back then as it does today. This alone can pretty much debunk the theory. Still, in the 1980s, a researcher named Robert Boval suggested the three pyramids of the Giza complex were made to mimic the three stars on Orion's belt. This simple theory spiraled into the Egyptian pyramids being seen as literal gateways to the stars. In official circles, it's called the Orion Correlation Theory. The idea is that the ancient Egyptians built the pyramids as a kind of landing pad for extraterrestrial visitors, and they needed to be aligned with the correct stars. Some even say there was once a stargate here that allowed for instant Spontaneous travel from Earth to someplace far away. As cool of a theory as it is, it has a lot of holes. First of all, the Egyptians wrote down everything that happened. Nowhere in any of their texts did they mention designing the pyramids to match up with the stars. Additionally, the pyramids were each planned at separate times. They weren't all designed at once, but one after the other at the behest of different pharaohs. There wasn't one grand plan, just a bunch of rulers who wanted bigger and more impressive pyramids than their predecessors. Stonehenge Pig Lard Researchers believe they may have just figured out how the megalithic rocks of Stonehenge were moved into place. If the theory is correct, it could confirm once and for all how Stonehenge was created 5,000 years ago. Researchers like archaeologist Lisa Marie Shilito made their most recent hypothesis by analyzing ceramic pots found near Stonehenge. They were taken from Durrington Walls, where the builders lived while the monument was under construction. The pots held trace levels of pig fat. Originally, researchers had thought the pots were used for cooking food, but it appears they might have been used to collect fat dripping off pigs as they were roasted. This pig grease would have been stored and turned into lard, and then it would have been used to lubricate sleds. The lubricating of the sleds with lard would have significantly helped primitive druids move the massive stones. They basically used the lard like water on a slip and slide to haul them across vast distances to where Stonehenge stands today. The Cloud Warriors of Peru's at Atlantis. There is a mysterious race of people who once lived in what some have called the Peruvian Atlantis. They are known officially as the Chachapoya, or the Cloud People, and they are thought to have thrived around 750 to 800 AD in Peru. They carved out settlements in the dense mountain forests in the northern Andes, prospered greatly, built an impressive kingdom, and then fell to the Inca in 1470.
The true name of these people is still unknown, since Chachapoya was the name given to them by the Inca before they were conquered. In 1535, when the Spanish arrived and discovered the mysterious cloud people being subjugated by the Inca, they formed an alliance. Spanish conquistadors wrote of how impressed they were with the ferocity and strength of the unusual tribe in the mountains. The Spanish were hoping to work together with the cloud warriors to defeat the Inca more easily. Then they would give the Chachapoya the land back which was stolen from them. However, the arrival of the Europeans was the beginning of the end for the cloud people of South America. Smallpox spread across the New World and wiped out every last Chachapoya. It spread all the way to the Aztecs in Mexico and helped wipe them out too. One of the strangest descriptions of the Chachapoya came from a Spanish conqueror named Pedro Cieza de León. It's his description of the cloud people that really makes them so mysterious. He wrote that the cloud warriors of the Andes Mountains were the whitest and most handsome of any people he had ever seen. He also said their wives were the most beautiful women, much more beautiful than the wives of the Inca. Pedro León was not the only Spanish conqueror to write about the cloud warriors either. Everyone who described them did so in the same way. And because of this, we know the Chachapoya were blonde, had light skin, and looked more European than South American. But what was a race of white people doing in Peru 1,000 years ago? They would have been the only white-skinned people in the entire Western Hemisphere. And scientists have no obvious explanation. The Darkest Day on May 19, 1780, the sun came up as it did every day, but only for a moment. The skies over New England then became dark, as if it were the blackest night. It became known as the Dark Day, when women screamed and held their babies and men dropped to their knees and prayed. Even George Washington, in the midst of fighting the Revolutionary War, wrote in his diary about the mysterious darkness that shrouded every city in gloom. This was such a huge deal that thousands of workers reportedly left their jobs early and either went straight to church or straight to the tavern. The children were sent home from school, cattle stopped grazing and hid in their stalls, and everywhere in New England, people thought Judgment Day had come. But what actually happened? Amazingly, it wouldn't be until the 2000s that scientists finally figured out what caused such widespread panic. Scientists discovered fire scars near the Great Lakes in Canada from the year 1780. There was a wildfire burning in Canada so severe that it sent giant black clouds over New England to block out the sun. It was nothing but a wildfire, and yet it inspired mass hysteria on an unprecedented level. The Ogre Neanderthals In folklore, an ogre is a gigantic humanoid monster. Ogres are found in fairy tales and legends and in just about every fantasy movie. Ogres are almost always depicted as unintelligent, oafish, and dull. And not unlike the trolls in The Lord of the Rings, real ogres supposedly eat human flesh. These creatures have been used to scare children since stories were first being told. In medieval Europe, young kids were warned that if they weren't on their best behavior, an excited ogre would attack them, kidnap them, and then probably eat them. There are other stories about ogres as well. Some who have written of these mythical creatures over the years have painted them in gentler light, making them shy and reclusive and misunderstood. But what if ogres weren't creatures of myth at all? And what if ogres and trolls originated from something that was a very real and living being? There is a curious theory that says trolls and ogres started off as Neanderthal humans. It's true that Homo sapiens lived at the same time as Neanderthals, and some theories say we were even the ones who destroyed them through our expansion out of Africa. Based on all the Neanderthal bones scientists have investigated, we know these creatures were bigger and stronger than us, more ape-like and a lot more ogre-esque. And so, what if the ogre from ancient mythology is just a weird memory of our distant relatives, the Neanderthals? We don't know if it's true, but experts say it could be a real possibility. The Star Shaft There are two narrow ducts leading out of the king's chamber in the Great Pyramid of Giza. These shafts are commonly referred to as star shafts. There are also two shafts in the walls of the queen's chamber, though these aren't quite as popular as the other two. It's because these star shafts are blocked on both the outside and the inside. 
leaving experts with very little clue as to what they were used for. Not only that, but if scientists compare the star shafts in the King's Chamber to those of the Queen's Chamber, their scientific theory doesn't make much more sense. Scientists believe the shafts were meant to circulate air, but if that were the truth, why would the star shafts in the Queen's Chamber be sealed? Plus, these kinds of shafts have not been found in any other pyramid in Egypt, which casts major doubt on the whole ventilation theory. But because scientists can't verify the purpose of the shafts, all we're left with is speculation. Some experts believe they were used to observe certain stars from inside the pyramid itself. This theory is getting way more traction than the ventilation hypothesis and is the closest we've gotten to a logical answer. Scientists suggest the shafts were meant to point at Alpha Draconis, Orion's Belt, Sirius, and Beta Ursae Minoris. The star shafts were most likely meant to direct the spirit of the pharaoh to these stars so that he could go on a journey through the cosmos. Russian Moose Geoglyph There is a mysterious geoglyph in Russia that might just be older than the famous Nazca Lines of Peru. The strange pattern in Russia can be found near Lake Zayuratkul, not far from the border of Kazakhstan. It shows what appears to be some kind of moose or deer, something with a long muzzle, four legs, and at least two antlers. The entire geoglyph measures 900 feet long and was only discovered in 2011. It can only be seen from the sky, and as in such a remote region, nobody ever noticed it before. Plus, the geoglyph was covered by a thin layer of soil, and it was almost completely invisible. According to Stanislav Grigoriev from the Russian Academy of Sciences Institute of History and Archaeology, the geoglyph was made from small and large stones. Bigger stones were placed along the edges of the geoglyph like borders, and the insides of the structure were filled in with much smaller stones. The hooves of the moose were put together using small crushed rocks and pieces of clay. Even more miraculous is the fact that excavation teams have found stone pickaxes and other primitive tools that had been used to create the ancient artistic masterpiece. These tools date back to the Neolithic period, between 6,000 and 3,000 years ago. That makes the Russian moose at least 2,500 years older than the Nazca Lines. But what in the world the moose is doing in the middle of the Russian wilderness is still a mystery. Baalbek Trilithon in the Lebanese town of Baalbek, once known as Heliopolis or the City of the Sun, there lies a gigantic and very mysterious piece of rock. It's the largest hewn stone ever found, a truly megalithic piece of debris at the ruins of the Jupiter Baal Temple. The Jupiter Baal Temple was an ancient place of worship built by the Romans in 27 BC. This was when they were still worshipping what would soon become false idols and old gods, like Baal from Canaanite mythology. In front of the temple, which today is nothing but a decrepit ruin, there are three large hewn stones. Each one weighs over 750 tons, and they are known together as the Trilithon. But the stones might not have anything to do with the temple after all. The big mystery about them is that scientists believe they predate the founding of Heliopolis and even Alexander the Great in 334 BC. This would mean the temple was built around the stones, and that they had been carved into blocks by an unknown group who came before them. And finally, there's the biggest stone of all. In addition to the Trilithon, there is a huge stone called the Stone of the Pregnant Woman inside the temple itself. It was carved but never moved, and weighs roughly 1,200 tons. To put that into perspective, that's the same weight as three Boeing 747s, or large commercial airplanes. The stone was cut, never transported, and the temple seemed to have been built around it. It's almost as if this stone was what the ancient Romans were worshipping. Cyclopean Walls Cyclopean masonry was the ancient architectural style of fitting together very large but non-uniform stone blocks without using mortar. Cyclopean masonry involved putting these weirdly shaped stone blocks together in such a precise way that not a single gap was left between them. Scholars say it was the Romans who built the astounding ancient walls of Italy, whose example of Cyclopean architecture can be found in Lazio, Umbria, Tuscany, and many other places. But some researchers don't think it was the Romans at all but someone who came much earlier. One of the biggest issues is that there isn't any Cyclopean masonry in Rome itself. 
These peculiar walls can only be found outside of Rome in smaller cities. Hilltop fortifications, aqueducts, agricultural terraces, and even villas in the countryside all boast Cyclopean styles. But the style itself goes back even beyond the Romans to the earliest Greek civilizations of the Bronze Age, starting around 3000 BC. It was the Mycenaeans who first fit giant boulders together to create these types of walls. And since it's clear that the Romans never practiced this kind of masonry, it's believed that the Mycenaeans, after the destruction of their cities in the Aegean around 1200 BC, migrated to Italy. It could have been these Mycenaeans, or at least their descendants, who built some of Italy's most impressive architecture. Mysterious Giant Circles A strange mystery only seen from the sky brings us to three countries, Turkey, Syria, and Jordan. Archaeologists have identified over a dozen mysterious circles in these countries, and nobody knows why they were built. One of them, a gigantic circle known only as J1, stretches 1,280 feet in diameter across the desert wasteland of Jordan. These circles are at least 2,000 years old, and each one is made of stones piled a couple of feet high, and each one is at least 1,000 feet in diameter. The first of these circles were seen by aircraft flying in the 1920s, and were more recently brought to the world's attention by researcher David Kennedy at the University of Western Australia. Kennedy told the Washington Post that it was 60 years after the circles were spotted the first time that anyone went back to look at them. But it's only been in the last decade that Kennedy and his team have tried to figure out what they are doing in the middle of the desert. Unfortunately, the scientists still don't have a clue. The walls were built too low to keep animals inside. They obviously weren't used for housing, and they couldn't have been used to keep food or valuables. They most likely weren't animal traps, as they wouldn't have been effective. The only thing researchers can think of is that these circles were used for some kind of ritual activity. But there's no real proof. Mystery Medieval Skeleton Archaeologists discovered the skeletal remains of a man face down in the muck of the River Thames in London. He was discovered still wearing his leather boots, which made him an instant celebrity in the world of archaeology. According to Beth Richardson from Mola Headland Infrastructure, the boots are about knee-high, made from leather quarters, and were stitched together using waxed flax thread. The workmanship of the boots dated the mysterious skeleton back to the 1400s. Once the body was dated, the big question became, how did he get in the river in the first place? Well, it all goes back to the boots. Since he was wearing gigantic leather boots all the way up to his knees, he was almost certainly either a mudlark or a fisherman. Mudlarks were people who waded through the polluted waters of London's greatest river looking for treasure and goodies. He might have been looking for coins or maybe scraps of metal. It could have been anything at all. He also could have been a fisherman who fell off a boat. But the prevailing theory right now is that he was looking through the mud for treasure when he got stuck and drowned. The Abernethy Round Tower The Abernethy Round Tower is one of Scotland's more unusual historical sites. It's one of two round towers built in the Irish style still standing in Scotland, and its origins are a complete mystery. Historians believe the tower was built in roughly 1100 AD and most likely served as a bell tower for a local church. The structure stands 73 feet high and has a diameter of 15 feet. A short climb to its top is definitely worth it because it offers sweeping views of the sprawling green countryside. It also gives a bird's eye view of the churchyard. One of the biggest mysteries surrounding the tower is the fact that its first 12 layers of brick are made of a completely different material than the rest of the tower. There is a big chunk at the bottom that's clearly older than the rest, leading historians baffled as to when the original structure was built. It may have been a smaller tower with fewer floors, then was torn down and reconstructed. The newest part of the tower is the clock, which was installed in 1868. The Battle of Jahi after 3,000 years, the Bronze Age came to an explosive end with the bloody and violent battle between Pharaoh Ramses III of Egypt and the mysterious sea people of unknown origins. At the time, the Egyptians and the Hittites were some of the two last remaining powers. The third remaining power was one that didn't really have a home base. The Egyptians had the land of the Nile, while the Hittites ruled Anatolia. 
It appeared as though these sea people came from nowhere. Then they used surprise and tenacity to raid the coastal cities of the Mediterranean. They came with mighty force and crippled great kingdoms by destroying their seaside towns. It was such a disaster that they brought the destruction of the Bronze Age and a massive shift in civilization. The beginning of the end was 1180 BC. The Hittite Empire was in the throes of a terrible famine, experiencing social unrest, and there were issues with the royal line. That was when the Sea People struck against them. But after they brought the Hittite Empire down, they found themselves facing the same problem as the Hittites were having. They had no food and their people were dying. So the Sea People set sail for Egypt to steal their food and their land. The Sea People knew the only way they could take Egypt by force was if they split up into two different parties. They would attack from the land and the sea at the same time, using a pincer maneuver. But Ramses III saw it coming from a mile away and devised a plan to meet them twice in battle. He brought his army to preemptively strike, crushing the Sea People at the Battle of Jahi. Then he turned his army around and met the other party for the Great Battle of the Delta. He won both, crushing the Sea People and putting an end to their reign of terror. However, the Sea People had already done too much damage for it to be repaired. They had spent years pillaging the coastline of the Mediterranean at a time when most of Europe was struggling with a serious drought. They helped defeat the Hittite Empire, the Mycenaean civilization, the Kingdom of al and the Ugarit. And that's only to name a few. The Battle of Red Cliffs In the year 208 AD, the Battle of Red Cliffs was fought between the warlord Cao Cao and military commander Liu Bei. It was a defining battle in ancient Chinese history, pitting two of China's most legendary warriors against each other. At this period in time, China was divided by bloodthirsty warlords who each controlled a small region and fought against their neighbors. This had been going on for centuries, even thousands of years. All through the Han Dynasty, China was segregated by warlord clans. But nearing the end, the power had been divided mostly in half. Cao Cao had the brute strength of northern China behind him, while Liu Bei boasted armies from the south. In a way, the fight was north versus south. It was a massive and bloody conflict, and the southern coalition smashed Cao Cao and ended his lifelong pursuit of joining China under one rule. His own, of course. With the Battle of Red Cliffs finished, the Han Dynasty came to an end, and with most of the northern forces either dispersed or destroyed, Liu Bei was at an excellent advantage to try and unify China under his dominion. He worked to stabilize the country, but then it was split into three separate kingdoms. Cao Cao was beaten but not killed, and he went on to rule the small kingdom of Cao Wei. Liu Bei reigned over Shu Han, and a third man, Sun Quan, ruled Eastern Wu. This was the Three Kingdoms period, which only lasted for a brief time until 280 AD, and that was when all three kingdoms were united under the Jin Dynasty. The Battle of Hastings The Battle of Hastings was fought on October 14, 1066. King Harold II of England found himself on the losing end of history, as the Norman forces of William the Conqueror smashed his own, killed Harold, and proclaimed himself the King of Britain. This was a tremendous turning point in British history, because it saw the death of the very last Anglo-Saxon king, and the rise of the first Norman king. For a bit of background, William the Conqueror was Duke of Normandy. His blood could be traced all the way back to the Vikings. He was a direct relation to the Viking raider Rollo, who pillaged France in the 9th century and was given land and titles in Normandy. Normandy was in fact named after the Norsemen of whom the land was given. Years before the battle took place in 1051, William visited England and met his cousin, the English king Edward the Confessor. Edward had no children, and he promised to make William his heir. But after Edward died, the kingdom was handed over to Harold. This angered William, and he invaded England from France because he believed the throne was lawfully his. William's desire for the throne won him the battle, and he soon marched on London and beat the city into submission. Within just weeks of arriving on English soil, William the Conqueror became the first Norman King of England, and Europe was forever changed. So was England, who soon after began speaking French as their national language. 
The Battle of Plataea The Battle of Plataea was fought between the Greeks and the Persians in the year 479 BC. The previous year, the Greeks and Persians had gotten into a vicious naval battle that saw the Greeks come out on top. Xerxes I, ruler of Persia, had been decimated by the highly trained Greek hoplite warriors and their superior naval skills. The Greeks would once more defeat the Persians at the Battle of Plataea, ushering in an immense period of wealth, prosperity, and flourishing Western culture. This was an extremely important battle because of what was happening in the years before. Starting in the 5th century BC, Darius I of Persia expanded his territory into mainland Europe. He wiped out Thrace and Macedonia, and his next target was the Greeks. The Greeks were a thorn in the side of just about every civilization that had ever risen up in the area. They were undefeatable, but Darius needed them out of his way if he was to expand through Europe and rule the world. In 490 BC, the Greeks met the Persians at the Battle of Marathon. Persia was humiliated and sent home crying. Then when Xerxes became king in 486 BC, he followed in his father's footsteps and once again tried to take Greece. He was stalled at the Battle of Thermopylae by the Spartans, but he did come out victorious. The Spartans gave the Greeks enough time to get their affairs in order, and by the time Xerxes continued his march, the Greeks were ready to wipe him out. Xerxes had the largest army the world had ever seen, with around 200,000 armed men involved in the fighting. A battle of that size wasn't seen again until Waterloo. With Greece as the victor, Persia was stopped dead in their tracks. Big thank you to Narin Zulfikar and Noble Harvey. Thanks so much for watching and supporting this channel. If you are new here, be sure to subscribe if you haven't already for more amazing history. The Battle of Milvian Bridge The Battle of Milvian Bridge was fought between Roman Emperor Constantine and Roman Emperor Maxentius on October 28, 312. It was a major event in history because with Constantine's victory, he was propelled forward along the path that would place him as the sole emperor of Rome. And once he was the emperor, things changed for Europe dramatically. The Roman Empire was too big to manage. It was vast and emperors were springing up everywhere. Maxentius ruled North Africa and parts of Italy. Constantine, also known as Constantine the Great, was the official emperor. The forces of Constantine and Maxentius met at the Milvian Bridge, which crosses the Tiber River and leads directly into Rome. This proved to be a poor decision for Maxentius. Constantine made powerful initial advances. Maxentius tried to retreat and regroup, but his soldiers were choked by the bridge. They got clogged on the bridge and Constantine's men cut them down easily. Part of the bridge also collapsed, stranding some groups of soldiers and sending others into the river where they drowned. Maxentius himself was thrown by his horse into the river and drowned before the battle was even over. The Battle of Gagamela Over a century after the Greeks stopped the Persians from spreading any deeper into Europe, there was a great showdown between Macedon and the Persian army. The forces of Macedon were led by Alexander the Great, while the Persians were led by King Darius III. Unlike the first brawl between Europe and Persia, this one had devastating consequences for Persia. It was the final blow to the Achaemenid Empire, which had ruled Western Asia since 550 BC. The Achaemenid Empire was the largest empire in the world. It spanned millions of square miles, but it could never push past Greece's borders. The Battle of Gaugamela took place in 331 BC. The fighting happened on the outskirts of an old village in what is today Iraq. The Persians believed they would win since they outnumbered Alexander's army significantly. Most historians agree that the odds would have been enough to make most generals surrender or flee, but Alexander used superior tactics, giving him a decisive victory and leading to the complete collapse of Persia. With the Achaemenid Empire out of commission, Alexander was allowed to begin his conquest of the known world. The Battle of Zulu The records of the Grand Historian is a long and complex history of China a retelling of every major event throughout China's 24 dynasties. The book was written in the early 1st century BC by the historian Sima Qian. It's very near to the start of this record that the second major battle in Chinese history is detailed. It's called the Battle of Zhu Lu, and it was one of the first important fights that earned itself a place in a history book. 
The battle was waged in the 26th century BC over 4,500 years ago. It was fought between the legendary Yellow Emperor and the Juli tribes of Chiyu. These two primitive and yet powerful armies came together along the plains of Zulu to fight over the fertile land of the Yellow River Valley. The Yellow Emperor won, and history was changed forever. The Yellow Emperor established the capital of what would soon become the agricultural confederacy of the Huaxia civilization, and from there, the civilization would evolve into the powerful Han Chinese nation. The Battle of Agincourt The Battle of Agincourt is one of the most famous in all of English history. The battle took place during the Hundred Years' War between France and England. Henry V led his army into northern France after crossing the English Channel two months prior with 11,000 men. He laid siege to the city of Harfleur in Normandy. He took the town after five long weeks, but lost half of his men doing it. Half the army was already gone from disease and casualties. And even with only about 5,000 men left, Henry pushed his army northeast to Calais. But in his way stood an army of 20,000 French. They outnumbered the exhausted English over four to one. On October 25, 1415, the English had no choice but to fight. The battle started at 11 o'clock in the morning, and the English stood their ground and let the French advance on them. As the French charged up the field to battle, they were bombarded by artillery and arrows. The English had highly advanced longbows and were able to rain down death on the charging French. Plus, the French cavalrymen couldn't reach the archers because they had protected themselves with a wall of pointed stakes. As more and more French poured into the battlefield, their numbers meant less and less. They were cut down by the arrows, squeezed into a bottleneck, and butchered by the English. In the end, the French lost about 6,000 men, while the English lost only 400. It was one of the most astounding and impressive victories in military history and would lead Henry V to be recognized as heir to the throne of France years later in 1420. The Battle of Ravenna The Battle of Ravenna was the last battle ever fought by the Roman Empire. It took place in the year 476, after the barbarians had already invaded Rome, ripped out its heart, and plunged the empire into darkness and chaos. Rome was sacked in 410 by the Visigoths, then again in 455 by the Vandals. By the time the Battle of Ravenna commenced in 476, the Roman Empire had lost almost all of its power. The final emperor was Romulus Augustulus, who was not recognized as a legitimate ruler outside of Italy. The Eastern Roman Empire, which would thrive for another thousand years, recognized Julius Nepos as the rightful emperor in the West. The fighting took place between Rome and the Herulians. The Herulians were a group of mercenaries who had fought for the Roman army of Italy but they weren't happy with the way things were going or with their pay. They rebelled against the unrecognized Roman emperor under the leadership of Odacer. On September 2, 476, the Roman garrison was massacred by the much more motivated mercenaries. The last capital of Rome, the city of Ravenna, was captured. Within hours, 1,200 years of Roman rule was officially finished. The Battle of Haran the Battle of Haran was the first major battle in the aftermath following the First Crusade. It was fought on May 7, 1104 between the forces of the Crusaders in Antioch and the Seljuk Turks. During the First Crusade, the Crusaders had established states in their conquered territories. Antioch was one of these states, as was Edessa. And although these wars were called Crusades, they were really just expansion projects on behalf of the Franks and the Latin Church to conquer all Muslim-held lands. The battle was an absolute disaster for the Crusaders. It was such a big defeat that the Muslim forces were shown just how vulnerable the Crusaders really could be. In the aftermath of the battle, which was brutal and saw the Crusader forces torn apart by the Turks, most of the territory gained in the First Crusade revolted. Antioch was thrown into turmoil. The Muslims regained most of the territory that was lost and the Second Crusade started shortly after to regain all that lost territory, and all because of one disastrous battle. The Giza Transmitters The greatest piece of advanced technology in the ancient world may very well have been the Great Pyramid of Giza. It's believed that the Egyptian pyramids were originally designed to be gigantic energy transmitters. 
There are theories that claim the Great Pyramid was a large machine, not a stone tomb. In the past, the structure may have been capable of producing and transmitting energy, perhaps electromagnetic frequencies. It could have acted as a kind of power plant that would harness energy from the Earth's vibrations and then convert that energy into pure electricity. But if this is true, who was using that electricity? The answer is most likely the ancient Egyptians. If the pyramids really were oversized batteries, they would have been used to distribute clean and limitless energy to the people of ancient Egypt. This means that thousands of years ago, the Egyptians would have had lights and power. But the problem is that nobody has ever found any archaeological evidence of this. As far as historians are aware, the Egyptians never had any kind of electricity or power. So the bizarre theory is this. If the ancient Egyptians weren't using the electricity from the pyramids for themselves, it's likely that someone else was benefiting from it. One theory is that the giant pyramid-shaped energy transmitters could have been used for recharging alien ships. It sounds outrageous, but some scholars agree that Egyptians did have contact with extraterrestrials. It's possible the aliens helped the Egyptians build the pyramids so they could power their own vessels, and then they took their advanced technology with them when they left. What do you think about this? Let me know in the comments below. The Greek Laptop Daudis was a famous painter in ancient Athens between 500 and 460 BC. Back in those days, people didn't paint on large canvases, but instead left their artwork on solid pottery. Throughout his long career as an artist, Daudis completed an estimated 300 vases. Archaeologists know he was popular among the Greeks because he often signed his name on vases that he didn't even paint, sort of like an ancient autograph. This suggests his artwork was also reproduced, similar to how you can find imitations of any famous artist's work today. It's likely that people would have recreated his pottery in order to sell them for a huge profit. But there's something even stranger. One of the vases painted by Daudis appears to show a man busily working on a laptop. It seems to be proof of highly advanced technology used by the ancient Greeks. The vase depicts a man sitting in a chair. He is hunched over what looks like a laptop, and he even has a stylus pen in one hand. Some say this is evidence of either time travel or ancient Greek computers. However, archaeologist Janet Grossman says it's all just conspiracy nonsense. She claims the object isn't a laptop, but a wax writing tablet used in ancient Greece. This is a compelling argument, although some still say it's difficult to explain the possible USB port that can be seen on the side of the so-called wax tablet. Viking GPS Medieval Vikings always knew where they were going, and it was all thanks to an extremely primitive GPS. It was more of a fancy compass, but it was still the first kind of positioning system that was ever used by humans. The Vikings may have been ruthless warriors, but they were also some of the best mariners of their time. They were capable of traveling all across the North Atlantic in an almost perfect straight line, from Scandinavia all the way to Canada. They did this with the help of innovative technology that the world had never seen before. The supposedly barbaric Vikings invented a miraculous compass that worked even when the sun had dipped below the horizon. This amazing tool was discovered in Greenland by archaeologists in 1948. The device has since been called the Unartok disk. It was a navigational tool used by the Vikings 1,000 years ago to travel from Norway to Greenland, a journey of 1,600 miles. Researchers believe that although the small wooden disk could have functioned alone, it was likely used with other tools, such as crystals and a flat slab of wood. Back then, it was almost impossible to navigate when the sun was down, since you can't track the sun if it's not in the sky. To solve this issue, the Vikings used crystal sunstones, which are natural calcite stones that produce specific patterns when exposed to the UV rays of sunlight. When the crystals are held in the sky, even after sunset, they can still pinpoint the sun's position underneath the horizon. The Vikings used these crystals, along with their wooden compass device, to track the sun through the night, allowing them to complete long journeys across the sea 
with extreme navigational accuracy. The Colosseum The Romans were responsible for a lot of fantastic inventions, as well as advanced pieces of technology. They were able to cut stone with the same precision as modern stonemasons. They carved complex underground wonders and even pioneered nanotechnology. However, one of the most impressive pieces of engineering in ancient Rome was the Colosseum. To this day, the Colosseum is the largest amphitheater ever built, and yet it's almost 2,000 years old. Researchers are still baffled that the structure was ever finished and that the Romans ever embarked upon such a seemingly impossible task in the first place. The idea for the Roman Colosseum began under the rule of Emperor Vespasian in the year 70 AD. It took about two years of planning, but construction began in 72 AD. Unfortunately, there are no records of the chief architect behind the design, and we don't know the specifics of what went on during the construction. All we know is that it was completed in the year 80 AD under Emperor Titus, Vespasian's heir. But why did the Romans build the Colosseum in the first place? Historians believe it was created to appease an angry population. The people of Rome were upset after the rule of Emperor Nero, who was arguably the worst Roman leader in history. To show that he wasn't as heartless and awful as Nero had been, Emperor Vespasian wanted to make something that would exhibit the glory and strength of Rome. They also hoped that the general population would be distracted and entertained with bloodshed in the Colosseum. This would make it easier for those in power to carry on with their dirty political work. The Colosseum required about 3.5 million cubic feet of stone, which was pulled out of the quarry near modern Tivoli. Similar amounts of Roman concrete, bricks, and volcanic rock were also needed for its construction. However, the concrete is what allowed the structure to be so solid. Then, to finish the magnificent amphitheater, 300 tons of iron clamps were used in order to hold everything together. Iron from the sky King Tutankhamun was born sometime around the year 1341 BC. He was the son of Pharaoh Akhenaten, who was one of the most hated pharaohs in Egyptian history. He was removed from power after ruling for 17 years, and nine-year-old Tutankhamun took his place on the throne. Sadly, the young boy passed away from a gangrene infection just 10 years later. His body was buried in the Valley of the Kings, like all the pharaohs that came before him. His tomb was sealed and lost, but was discovered again in 1922 by Howard Carter, a British archaeologist. The tomb was filled with all kinds of amazing treasures and was an absolute gold mine of extraordinary items. One of the unexpected discoveries was a dagger with an iron blade and a decorative gold handle. The dagger was an unexpected find because it was the only thing made of iron in the tomb. In the days of Tutankhamun, iron was considered extremely rare and was more valuable than gold because it was not something the Egyptians had access to. Archaeologists have only found a few iron items from that time period, and most of them came from outer space. It's believed that the dagger King Tut was wearing had been fashioned from a meteorite. Archaeologists even know the exact meteorite the iron came from. Its name is Karga, and it was discovered about 150 miles west of Alexandria. We know this based on the composition of iron, nickel, and cobalt from King Tut's knife which matches exactly with the Karga meteorite. Even without the ability to extract raw iron, the Egyptians somehow knew how to fashion a meteorite into a dagger. It's shout out time! I want to give a big thank you to Rolando Ochoa and American Joe TV for supporting this channel. Be sure to subscribe if you haven't already for more videos about amazing discoveries and strange history. Tesla's Anti-Gravity Machine Nikola Tesla was such a magnificent genius that some think he may have been an alien. But this theory has been proven untrue since we know Tesla was born in Croatia to Serbian parents in 1856. However, some of the inventions he created throughout his career seemed completely out of this world. In 1928, Tesla registered a patent for a flying machine that looked like a hybrid between a helicopter and an airplane. It was a proposed spaceship that would utilize anti-gravity technology to propel itself through the cosmos. Before the famous inventor died, he revealed the blueprints for the propulsion system of his amazing aircraft. He called it a space drive and claimed it was an anti-electromagnetic field propulsion system. 
Unfortunately, Tesla's creation was never brought to life, and we haven't seen an anti-gravity machine that really works. But Tesla supposedly figured it out almost a century ago. Then, for whatever reason, his technology was forgotten. Puma Punku's Stonework One of the most incredible places in all of Bolivia is the ruined temple complex of Puma Punku. It's located near the city of Tiwanaku and its origin is considered a mystery. The complex was thought to have been built during the height of the Tiwanaku Empire, which thrived between 300 and 1000 AD. They were one of the most powerful civilizations in South America before the rise of the Inca Empire and the arrival of the Spanish. The most fascinating thing that can be found in Puma Punku is its stonework. The buildings here were constructed using highly advanced techniques that haven't been seen anywhere else in Bolivia or Peru. Megalithic blocks, each one weighing several tons, were stacked so precisely that they are still interlocked like puzzle pieces. These immense stones fit together so perfectly that you can't even slide a razor blade between them. These blocks were created with machine-like qualities, and they even had holes drilled into them as if they had access to power tools. This was a civilization that hadn't even figured out how to write, and yet their stonework can hardly be recreated today. Because of this, some have speculated that the people of Puma Punku may have had help from extraterrestrial visitors. Ancient Aluminum A mysterious object was discovered on the muddy shores of the Muris River in Romania. It was buried at a depth of about 33 feet and was originally found in 1973. What made the discovery so shocking was that the piece of metal, some form of aluminum, was estimated to be roughly 250,000 years old. That would mean it's been around since before humanity started working with metal, long before we even left the comfort of our cozy caves. The mysterious object is the source of a lot of controversy. Archaeologists say it's an extremely lightweight metal that was likely manufactured. It's 90% aluminum, and some experts believe it could have come from alien visitors. Because of how deep it was found in the mud, there is no way that anyone accidentally lost the random object. Maybe it was a fragment of a UFO that fell off the craft, like a loose bolt. But there are those who say it could also be the byproduct of human engineering from a quarter of a million years ago. Experts are stumped, and nobody knows for sure where it came from. These days, the mysterious metal object is on display at a history museum in Romania. The curators of the museum still say its origin is unknown. The Roman Goblet An incredibly smart Roman designed and built a chalice that could change color using nanotechnology 1,600 years ago. It's called the Lycurgus Cup, and it looks like any ordinary cup from the end of the Roman Empire. It depicts King Lycurgus of Thrace in an epic scene, which is how it earned its name. But what makes the chalice so remarkable is that depending on the direction the light hits it, it's a totally different color. When the cup is lit from the front, it's a bright green, but when the light hits it from the back, it turns blood red. Archaeologists at the British Museum were given the glass chalice in the 1950s, although it's unclear exactly where it came from. It wasn't until 40 years later that researchers in England looked at fragments of the chalice under a microscope. This is when they discovered that the Roman artisan who crafted the chalice used nanotechnology. They put particles of gold and silver inside the glass, each particle only being about 50 nanometers in diameter. That's significantly smaller than one grain of table salt. It was highly meticulous work that couldn't have possibly been an accident. The Roman artisan perfected the use of nanoparticles to change the look of the chalice based on the direction of the light. According to archaeologist Ian Freestone from University College London, the cup changes color because of electrons in the metal flex. The electrons vibrate at a certain frequency that changes the color depending on the way you look at the chalice. This is extremely advanced science and way beyond what we imagine the Romans were capable of. It's also the only surviving example of such technology ever being used. Giant Stone Boxes Ancient aliens may have built giant stone boxes in Egypt about 3,300 years ago. At the Serapium of Saqqara, a large cemetery near Memphis, archaeologists found something unbelievable. Underground stone boxes were uncovered here, 
and historians say they were used to bury sacred bulls. Each box weighs roughly 100 tons and was crafted from pure granite. What makes these stone boxes so shocking is that they were made with 21st century precision. Brian Forrester, an expert on ancient Egypt, says the tomb in which the giant stone boxes were found was also made with incredible accuracy. The angles of the tomb are almost exactly 90 degrees, and the interior is within a couple ten thousandths of an inch from being perfectly flat. Someone built an amazingly advanced tomb and filled it with giant boxes for burying sacred Egyptian bulls. The extreme precision of the boxes is the reason some believe it was aliens who created them. But then again, did the Egyptians really need aliens to help them with their construction? We already know the Egyptians boasted an advanced knowledge of geometry. They were able to estimate pi, and they knew how to find the volume of a truncated pyramid. Based on this, it's not hard to believe they were able to make smooth surfaces and carve massive blocks of granite. Roman Superstition There were many bizarre beliefs in ancient Rome, many of them bordering on extreme superstition. Romans believed it was bad luck for a groom not to carry his bride over the threshold of their home, a tradition that still carries on today. But there were a lot weirder superstitions going on in ancient Rome as well. Whenever a magistrate of the city, an elected official, passed across the border at the edge of Rome itself, they had to participate in a brief ceremony in which a priest would tell them whether they would have good or bad luck on their journey. This was mandatory every time the magistrate crossed Rome's invisible border. There was also a lot of fortune-telling going on. The Romans practiced Audrey, which was to divine the future by studying the behavior of birds. There were very real professionals who studied birds and then predicted what the future would hold. They did this based on how the birds were flying, how many there were, and what kind of noises they were making. These specialized bird priests were pretty popular. Then there was an even more disturbing form of divination called haruspicy. This would allow a clearer version of the future to be seen by examining the entrails of slaughtered animals. This was considered far more accurate than bird watching in Roman culture. A person who conducted this glimpse into the future was called a haruspex, and it was nasty business. A large animal would be sacrificed to the gods, then the haruspex would sort through the liver, heart, lungs, intestines, and other organs to determine what would happen in the future. God on the Brain A recent scientific study showed that the belief in God, a god, or a supernatural omnipresent force is programmed into certain parts of our brain. These specific parts that make us susceptible to belief in a higher power are not found in the brains of animals, which make it an extraordinarily peculiar part of our physiology and a really weird step in evolution. Even more alarming is that this discovery could imply that we were biologically designed to serve a set of gods. In other words, something a lot smarter than us biologically fitted our brains with a mechanism to make us more willing to be subservient to what we view as our heavenly masters. The hypothalamus, amygdala, and hippocampus react strangely during MRI scans when a person engages in religious meditation. Whenever somebody feels like they've connected to their higher power, these parts of the brain light up with activity. Neurologists believe this is because there is a neural imperative to believe in God, or gods, they are just not sure how or why. There appears to be a God module in the brain that may have been placed there on purpose many hundreds of thousands of years ago. There is some speculation that whoever put the God module in our brains was the same being who brought us out of the cave and taught us how to build pyramids. That's taking it a little bit to the extreme, but what do you think? The Namahaye A monster called the Namahaye emerged in ancient Japan around 2,000 years ago. Legend has it the monster originated in the city of Oga in Akita Prefecture and was used as a tool to frighten lazy or misbehaved children. The Namahaje was such a frightening creature that children wholeheartedly believed it would come for them if they didn't obey and listen to their parents. The legend began as an oral tradition, but eventually grew to become such a cultural phenomenon that the Namahaye Festival was born, and it's still happening today in Japan. 
According to the original story, the Namahaye was a group of demon ogres, notorious for stealing crops and kidnapping young women from local villages. To drive the unwanted demons out of their city, the villagers came up with a plan. They gave the demons a building project and said if they could finish by morning, they could have all the women in the village at once. But before morning came, the villagers forced their roosters to start crowing, thereby tricking the demons into thinking morning had already come. They then left and only returned to kidnap naughty children. What's really strange is the connection between the ogre demons called the Mahaye and Santa Claus. The demons are said to go house to house, banging on doors and asking parents if their children have been naughty or lazy. They even carry a book with them in which they write down the names of all the kids in town, marking which ones have been naughty or nice. And if the new year comes around and the children haven't shaped up, the demons will kidnap the kids, especially if you don't give them sake and rice cakes. The Truth of Gnosticism during roughly the first 300 years of Christianity, things changed very rapidly. Before the introduction of a central authority, meaning the church itself as instituted by Rome in 312, Christian communities taught whatever they wanted. They all generally believed in Jesus Christ, but things could get very different depending on which community you belonged to. It was around the 2nd century AD that Gnostic Christians became a thing. The Gnosticism movement quickly spread, growing alongside what we might consider ordinary Christianity. But as the Gnostics grew more popular and started to push their message, believers of a different school of philosophy rose up to silence them. And thus, the Christians and the Gnostic Christians were forever separated. But what did and do the Gnostics believe in? Gnosticism is the belief that every person contains within them a divine spark or a piece of the Creator. The belief is that a piece of God fell from the ethereal world into humans and that every person is now born with a tiny fragment of God within them. They also believe that because physical matter is subject to rot and death, bodies were created by an inferior being and are inherently evil. The spark of God within humans is trapped inside this evil machine of flesh, stuck in the material world, and must be saved by the Redeemer, Jesus Christ. In the end, though, Gnosticism just didn't catch on with all of its talk of cosmic powers and duality, and ordinary Christianity came out on top. And now for number six. But first, I want to give a big shout out to Kirito Terry and Travis King. Thanks so much for watching and supporting Origins Explained. If you are new here, be sure to subscribe and join the family. The Dragon and the Sun Solar eclipses were terrifying to ancient societies. Every culture around the world reacted strongly to the sudden eclipse of the sun, believing something huge was happening in their world. These days, we know why eclipses happen, and so it's not that scary for us. An eclipse is the natural movement of the universe, but to the people in ancient China, solar and lunar eclipses were omens to foretell the future, specifically the future of the emperor. The ancient Chinese believed that when a solar eclipse occurred, it was because a celestial dragon briefly devoured the sun. They truly believed there was a great dragon in the sky that swallowed the sun into its gullet. Whenever something like this happened, people all over the country would run outside with drums and pots and make as much loud noise as they could to frighten the dragon away. And since it worked every single time, they kept doing it. The tradition of scaring away the dragon that eats the sun is so strong in Chinese culture that people still haven't forgotten. In the 19th century, the Chinese navy fired their cannons during a lunar eclipse to stop the dragon before it could gobble up the moon. Greek Necromancy Being a necromancer in the ancient world was not all that uncommon. Even in prehistoric times, necromancy was hugely popular. Researchers believe it originated from shamanism, in which tribal shamans would communicate with the ancestors of the dead. Necromancy became a more evolved form of the practice, in which men no longer wanted to merely speak with spirits and ghosts. They instead wanted to resurrect them and call forth the spirits to do their bidding. In ancient Greece, necromancy may have reached its peak. They believed certain dead people knew certain things, normally based upon what they would have known while alive. In order to get the truth out of someone once they passed on, a necromancer would need to be hired to summon them forth from the netherworld and wrestle the information out of them. Necromancy is even discussed quite a lot in the Bible. 
There are necromancers called bone conjurers in the book of Deuteronomy. The Israelites are warned explicitly against humoring the Canaanite practice of asking the dead for answers. The Kabbalistic Tree of Life Scholars believe the concept of a tree of life goes back to ancient Assyria in the 9th century BC. The idea has grown to become a staple in almost every major religion. The ancient Norse believed in the tree of life, Christianity has its own tree of life, and Judaism has its Kabbalistic tree of life. The Kabbalistic tree of life is unique in that it's a type of mysticism used in Kabbalah, which is an old esoteric school of thought in Judaism. The Tree of Life is a diagram made up of 10 or 11 energy intelligences called sephirot, each one connected to a path. The idea behind the diagram is that it can help a person to understand the spiritual teachings of Kabbalah, but it's been interpreted a lot of different ways over the years. Some believe the tree is a representation of God's creation, leading from the divine revelation of the human soul to the total sum of reality. The first sphere on the tree is an infinite pool of primordial energy from which all things are made. Second is wisdom. Next comes understanding. Then the three supernal spheres representing the primordial energies of the universe. And after that, the next stages on the tree begin to build the materials of our very universe. At the final peak of the tree is the last stage, seen as the solidifying physical universe created through the long growth of the original eternal energies. There is also a tree of death. There is something called the Klyphoth in Jewish mysticism, or the evil version of the Sephirot, which comprises the tree of death. The Klyphoth are impure spiritual forces, almost like curses, reflecting the darkness itself. Swan Shamanism One of the oldest fundamental human beliefs in the world is that when a person dies, their soul turns into a swan and journeys from the physical realm into a world beyond. A recent discovery from an ancient cave near Tel Aviv in Israel has dated this belief back an incredible 420,000 years. Archaeologists working at the Qasem cave site uncovered evidence of a swan cult, or swan shamanists, thanks to a single swan wingbone. The bone was found to have clear knife markings on it, indicating the feathers had been removed on purpose, likely for some kind of ritual. What researchers found strange was that only a single swan bone could be found, whereas within the cave there were plenty of other ordinary bird bones. This means most of the birds were being eaten, but the swan had been used for something important. This was likely part of ancient swan shamanism. Researchers also found teeth from an extremely close relative of modern humans. They appear to be from a slightly different lineage, not quite anatomically identical to humans now, but very close. This is even more shocking because it shows that even before humans fully evolved, we were practicing cultic activity. Prehistoric hominids were worshipping swans because they believed they carried the souls of the dead into the afterlife. The Mystery Cult of the Cabaroi the sanctuary of the Kabaroi in ancient Thebes was devoted to the deities Kaberos and Pais, both of which are a total mystery. The sanctuary was likely built around 700 BC, and it became the site for a mysterious cult in ancient Greece. This was the mysterious cult of the Kaberoi. They worshipped gods introduced to Greece from a faraway land, starting in the northern Aegean and then slowly spreading through the rest of the country. The sanctuary in Thebes was at the epicenter of the mystery cult. We know almost nothing about the belief system of the sect. We only know that they existed, and we know the names of some of their principal deities. But what the cult of Kaberoi did, what they worshipped, and what their function was are totally unknown. They were active for an estimated 1100 years, and yet we don't know what exactly they did in all that time. It goes to show just how mysterious some of the ancient Greek religions really were. Within the temple sanctuary itself, archaeologists found a few things that give us clues, but not much. Excavators found a clay tub half buried in the ground, inscribed with the words, of the husband. The tub also had a hole in its bottom, suggesting it was meant for liquid offerings that would drain into the earth. The Monsters of Greece Most people know at least one or two ancient Greek myths, or at least a couple of Greek heroes from the myths. You'd be hard-pressed to find someone who's never heard of Zeus. But just how much did the ancient Greeks really believe in their own mythologies? Did the Greeks truly think Zeus was sitting atop Mount Olympus? Did they really believe Hercules battled a many-headed hydra? 
The answer is a little more complicated than you might think. The Greeks truly did believe in their gods. They built monumental temples to them, they offered sacrifices, and made impossible efforts to communicate with them. In ancient Greece, nothing could even get done without first consulting an oracle, who was seen as a kind of middleman between kings and gods. An inscription from about 2,300 years ago was discovered in which a man named Agis asked the Oracle of Zeus a question. The inscription reads, Ask Zeus about his pillows and blankets, whether he has lost them or whether someone has stolen them. Clearly the gods were extremely important to the Greeks. At this point, we have to assume the monsters were real to the Greeks as well. The world back then was a very scary place. Most people lived within a very small community, and nobody really knew what horrors might lurk just a few miles over the mountains and in the dark, unexplored forests, let alone all the natural disasters that were going on and the lunar eclipses. There were just a lot of things back in the day that could not be explained. Thanks for watching! Which of these ancient beliefs do you like the most? Let me know in the comments below and be sure to hit that subscribe button, and I'll see you next time! Bye!